Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and thanks for the organizers and for the, uh, the zoo to invite me. I'm actually a big fan of zoos. I know there's a lot of um, people who complain about zoos, but I think zoos have a function in, in an increasingly urbanized society where people don't know nature anymore, or don't know animals anymore. And, and I think if zoos were just places where we keep animals, maybe we should not have them. But if zoos combine that with conservation and education, which this zoo is doing, uh, then it becomes functional and it becomes important, I think, for society to have them. And uh, in the US, for example, every year, 175 million people visit zoos. And these are not necessarily different people, the 175 million visitors to zoos. So that's an enormous number. Zoos are extremely popular. And, and I know most people walk around eating ice creams and stuff like that, but still they get education and they see animals and they connect with nature one way or another. And I think that's a very important function. So let me say a few things about the topic of today. I'm going to talk about animal emotions and what you may not realize, because most people who have animals at home, like dogs and cats, they, of course, they think that animals have emotions. Um, what they don't realize is that in science, we have for a century had opposition to the idea. So the, the Skinnerians, you know, Skinner, the one who trained rats to press levers and stuff like that, the Skinnerians don't like to talk about animal emotions. They think it's unscientific. And uh, they will say, for example, if you say, my dog is jealous, they will say, you're anthropomorphic. You're projecting human feelings on the animal. The animal doesn't have necessarily the same kind of feelings. And so for a century, we have been fighting with these behaviorists who wanted to look at animals as little machines, even though anyone who has a dog at home knows that animals are not little machines. But that's how they looked at it. And so that has been a struggle, a real struggle. And it, the interesting thing is that Darwin, in the 19th century, Darwin had no trouble with animal emotions. He wrote a whole book about human and animal emotions. And in those days, this, this was perfectly acceptable. It's only later that the book was closed on emotions and we were not allowed to talk about it. And the, the charge of anthropomorphism doesn't do me very much. I, I think we humans are primates. and making the connection between human and animal behavior is, is extremely easy to do and, and is scientifically justifiable. The other objection often to animal emotions is that, you, that people say, we don't know what they feel. For me, feelings and emotions are different things. Feelings are private states. Emotions are expressed in the body, in the face, in the voice, in the blood pressure. So, so emotions can be measured. Your dog's emotions are completely measurable. Your dog's feelings, I don't have access to. So, so th those are private states. And I must say, I have that same problem with human feelings. You, you can tell me that you felt sad at a funeral or something, or happy at a wedding. I still don't know if your sadness is the same as my sadness. Uh, and so you can tell me about things. And we, we humans, we like to talk about our emotions. But um, feelings are a different thing. So for animals, we, we cannot know the feelings at least not yet. And for humans, I would say that's also an overrated issue. A lot of people lie about their feelings. And uh, I live among psychologists. I'm a biologist, but I live among psychologists who trust everything that people tell them. They have them fill out questionnaires. And I don't trust anything people tell me. <laughs> I, I'm so glad I work with animals who don't talk and don't fill out questionnaires. Because you ask people about their sex lives and they will say, I do it so many times a week or whatever. <laughs> With animals, I can just count them. And, and I trust that far better than uh, whatever people tell me. So the face, the face is really the window of the soul. And everything started with the face. Darwin started with the face. And all the studies of human emotions start with the face. And the same facial expressions that we see in humans, we can see in other species. And, and there was a time where people would say, well, obviously, we humans, we have far more muscles in the face. We have thousands of little muscles. And so we have far more facial expressions, and we need them. 
because we have all these subtle emotions that we need to communicate on a daily basis with each other. Uh, five years ago, um, there was an analysis done of chimpanzee faces post-mortem where they counted the muscles and they cl classified them. The chimpanzee has exactly the same number of muscles in the face as the human. And so now we know that all these facial expressions that we see in humans and in other species can, can be compared. And, and that's a whole field of study. And, and I was lucky to have a professor when I was a student in the Netherlands who was specialized in facial expressions. And so I'm very familiar with that kind of work. If you look at the human face, you see all these little shades of emotions. And we are very used to that, and we pay attention to all of them. Uh, but if you work with uh, chimpanzees, you can see the same shades of emotions. And I think they have as many as, as we do. Uh, it's only that if you're not familiar with them, of course, you don't see them uh, in that kind of detail. But um, they're all there, I think. So the, the work of Paul Ekman was important in this, in, in that Paul Ekman is a psychologist, an American psychologist, who came up in a time um, where emotions were a taboo topic, also for humans, actually. You, you wouldn't believe it, but in humans, the emotions were also a taboo topic at some point. And uh, Paul Ekman um, heard from an anthropologist who told him that, um, of course, um, the emotions were different for all cultures. Uh, humans everywhere have different emotions and talk differently about emotions and express them differently. And he didn't believe that. And so he went around the whole world to see how people reacted to photographs and how they classified photographs of facial expressions, uh, happy, sad, and whatever. And he found that um, basically the expression of the emotions of the human species is the same all over the world, which, which is very logical if you look at, if you don't speak a language and you go to a country where you don't speak the language, you can, you can tell if the people are angry at you or happy with you or friendly to you. You can tell that very easily from their faces. And so we have the same facial expressions everywhere. And so he, he classified the emotions into six basic emotions. What is it? Sadness, joy, disgust fear, and so on. And so he said these six emotions are universally human. We share them also with other species. Uh, but all the other emotions, because there's many more than this, of course, he would call secondary. And, and if you look at psychology textbooks, they say that all these other emotions, they are uniquely human. And I don't agree with that part. Uh, I think the six basic emotions is a very limited set, and there's many more of them. Now, my own professor, Jan van Hoof, and I will get back to him at the very end of the talk because it relates to Mama's hug, but he was a specialist in facial expressions uh, and um, analyzed them in great detail in the primates and tried to trace the evolution of certain expressions or certain human expressions at the bottom here. And so uh, one of his main points was that the laugh and the smile are different expressions. We, we usually look at the laugh and the smile as sort of grading into each other, and the smile is a low-level laugh or something like that. But he said they come from different expressions, different primate expressions. You have in the primates, you have the, what we call the bear teeth face, the silent bear teeth face, which is a, a nervous expression. It, it's, it's nervous and submissive and fearful sometimes. And in humans, it became a friendly expression, but it's still a nervous expression. If someone smiles too much, you say it's a nervous person. So the nervousness is still in there, but we, we, we turn it into a fairly friendly or appeasing expression. And the laugh, which has an open mouth and doesn't show all the teeth all the time uh, and has a sound with it, the laugh is a playful expression. And the primates have the laugh also, even though Aristotle told us that we are the only species that laughs, the primates laugh also. And so these have different origins. So, for example, the silent Bertie's face, this is a, a monkey showing it in a submissive context where uh, being approached by a dominant individual. Uh, and, and in humans, we recognize the nervousness of, the, of, this, of this smile also still. <laughs> so, um, that's one origin, and, and it has an appeasement function. Um, for example, one study was done where they take, took photographs of fighters, human male fighters, who would look at each other and stare each other down and then take a picture of them before the fight. 
and the one who smiles more than the other is the one who usually loses the fight. And so they said the smile is used in the context where you're a little bit afraid of, of somebody. Now the laugh, this is a, my postdoc Zana who has been playing with a bonobo and, and they're both very relaxed and they have a very similar facial expression. And, and the laugh is used in playful contexts. So here you have a laughing chimp, here you have some laughing gorillas. And, and it comes with a sound um, that is also laughed, laughter. So I'm, I'm going to play that for you. So now we need some sound with the video. And this is um, uh, in a sanctuary where, where a man is tickling some chimpanzee babies. So, so young chimpanzees have the same tickling spots as kids under the armpits, in their belly, in their side. They also have the same ambivalence as children, is that when you tickle them, they push your hands away and they, they act as if they don't want you, but then if you stop, they want you to come back again. And so they, they have that same, same ambiguity. And, and the sound has been analyzed and, and the sound is actually quite similar. The rhythm of, well, it's, it's much more hoarse and it's not as loud. Human, human kids are extremely loud, in my opinion. Um, and I think it has to do with lack of predators. We, we don't have as many predators. So you can be loud and you don't need to pay for that. Then we get the rats. This is an interesting, we, we used to make fun of rats. And so these pictures, they make fun of rats, and I have the same picture for Queen Elizabeth also, actually. <laughs> so they, the rats were supposed not to have facial expressions, and that's why me, people made fun of it. But now we know that that's not true. There are studies on rats and mice where we can show that they have facial expressions and they express emotions. For example, one experiment was done in Switzerland where they would put a rat in a box, and in the box was... On the one side was a photograph of a rat in a relaxed situation. The other one was a rat who had just smelled a cat, so he was afraid. And the, the rats like to sit next to the picture of the relaxed rat. So they make a distinction between the two. So actually, rats and mice do have facial expressions. And then a, a, a scientist, a neuroscientist, started doing experiments on laughter in rats. And since you cannot hear the laughter of rats because it's um, ultrasonic, he would bring down the sound, and you will see him yak bang sip, you will see him tickling his rats, and you will hear some sort of sound that comes out of his machine that brings it down. I need sound with this. came on outrageously, you know, the highest levels we'd ever seen. And what he does here at the end is he moves his hand away and you see that the rat follows. And he does that in order to show that the rats actually like this tickling business. Uh, and so they uh, not only do they laugh, but we now know that these laughing sounds or play sounds can be found in many animals, uh, also in some birds. Uh, experiments have been done. If you play to kias, which are sort of parrots, the, play, the playful vocalizations, they become all playful. And so it, it's contagious, as in humans, laughter is contagious and is used in playful contexts. Now, some people have then argued, well, maybe, maybe uh, laughter can be found in other species, like in rats and in primates, but they certainly don't have a sense of humor. Not like us. A sense of humor is uniquely human. And I don't agree with that. I, we don't have good research on that, but let me tell you a few stories and let me give you a few examples. First of all, we did an, um, a sort of haphazard experiment at the zoo where I worked, where we had 25 chimpanzees. And uh, one of my coworkers put on a panther mask and hid himself in the bushes. And the chimpanzees were across the moat on the island, 
all sitting there. And then he showed his face, but then of course it was a, with a panta mask on it. Now the chimps got really mad at him and started throwing stuff at him, also smelly stuff and all sorts of things at him. And uh, he did it a, a couple of times, and each time the chimps get com got completely upset. And then at some point he stood up and he took the mask off. And all of a sudden the chimps looked at him, and some chimps showed that play face, the, the laugh expression. So some chimps thought this was a sort of an, a funny situation that he had created. And I think th the same happens with human laughter. If you tell a joke, we call that the punchline. The punchline is always an unexpected ending. So, so in this case with the panther mask, there was an unexpected ending, and that creates some laughter. And now let me show you two examples that are on video. There are very few examples in the world. This one was filmed in Africa by Japanese scientists. This is a chimpanzee, young chimpanzee male who is cracking nuts with stones, as they do. And his mom comes over and steals his stones. You will see how this goes. So he is sitting there, he's cracking his nuts. And it's very hard to find the stones. The nuts are easier to find than the stones. And so his mom comes over and grooms him, having noticed that he has these wonderful tools. And then, at some point, she presents herself, because that's a rule in chimpanzees. You groom, and then you have to return the grooming. So she's asking for the return grooming, and that she takes that occasion to steal his stone. She will see how that goes. You will see how that goes there, and look at her face. So she has tricked her own son. Well, he, uh, he will learn from this, I'm sure. And here you have another example. This is an orangutan at a zoo who is being tricked by a magician. And you will see the reaction. So even though we don't have real good research on, on the sense of humor, if I were a student now, I would, I would probably do that. I think it's a fun project to do the sense of humor in primates uh, and see if that exists. But I, I wouldn't exclude it. I don't think it's excluded. And I think they have these same reactions to unexpected endings as we do. Now this is a human laughter. Um, Bill Clinton visited Yeltsin, and you will see in the, in the clip, Yeltsin gets insulted by a journalist, and Clinton thinks that's funny. And what you will see is not only that, that it's very contagious, but also we lose, we lose control over our body when we laugh. I once heard a philosopher talk about human laughter and say, it's a very animalistic expression. We, we laugh and we lose control over ourselves. Why don't we just say, that was funny? Well, that, that, uh, that would be very unsatisfactory if, if you would make a joke and people only say that was funny. But um, that's how he felt. And with both laughter and crying, we lose control over our bodies. That what you were writing was that today's meeting with President Bill Clinton was going to be a disaster. <laughs> Uh, we well, now for the first time I can tell you that you're a disaster. <laughs> so look at Clinton. Cl Clinton is going to lose control. <laughs> he's, he's starting to cry. He's, he's going to lean on Yeltsin now because he cannot stand up. Now Yeltsin, Yeltsin is going to cry also. <laughs> so
So that's the essence of, uh, of laughter and crying, is that the body is so heavily involved. And I think in emotions, the body is always involved. So if, if you say, I was very emotional, and your body did nothing, your blood pressure did nothing, your voice did nothing, your expressions, then you're not really very emotional. Emotions involve always the body. And that's one of the reasons, actually, why they were underrated and not studied so much, because we humans, we like to think we are rational beings who don't need the body and don't need the emotions, but that's, of course, not the case. Now, the problem that I have is the basic emotions of um, Paul Ekman, is that what do we do with emotions that don't have a face? There are many emotions that are not expressed in the face, such as ex attachment and love and jealousy and grief that are not necessarily expressed in the face. And are we not, not going to call them basic emotions? So, for example, love is in Ekman's scheme not a basic emotion. I would say it's a very basic one, a very important one for, for, for us and for many other species. Or what do we do with animals who don't have facial expressions, like let's say the dolphin? Are we going to say that they don't have these emotions? So it's a very uh, simplistic view. I think that there are only six basic emotions. And in my view, we share all the emotions with animals. There are no uniquely human emotions, maybe spirituality or something. There's maybe a few. But there's very few uniquely human emotions in my view. So, so for example, for grieving, which is not one of the basic ones, but is very observable in other species. This is the famous case of a um, orca female who lost uh, her calf and, and kept, kept traveling around with it for 17 days or more, I believe. I don't know. If, yeah, 17 days uh, she kept the calf. And so we also know that for chimpanzee, when a female loses her offspring and it dies, she may travel for a whole month. With, um, at, at that point, it becomes a mummy. She, she keeps traveling around with it. So grieving is very well known now in other species, uh, including in, uh, in other species. And I just want to show you a little clip taken from my office window. I have an office that overlooks 25 chimpanzees. Uh, I prefer to see chimps over students. <laughs> I have this office, and uh, this was just a clip I took um, of a reunion between two female chimpanzees. It was a female who we had, we had taken out for three months. And, and then brought back and she, she's greeting everyone. And you will hear the sounds of her voice. The voice is a very important part of the emotions. In humans also, you talk to someone on the phone, you know exactly what kind of mood they are because the voice reflects, that's also part of the body that reflects the emotions pretty carefully. <laughs> Very much the same way as we feel. 
So about living in the present, emotions that relate to the past are things like forgiveness, revenge, gratitude, and we have evidence for all of this, and I'll, I'll get to that. And but related to the future, you have hope and planning, uh, and these emotions, I think, also exist. So if, for example, if, if a group of elephants follows the, the matriarch who knows some watering hole far away that they don't know, uh, they probably are filled with hope that they will find the water. So I don't think hope is excluded in other species. So as, as for forgiveness, I have done all my life studies on conflict resolution in the prior age, and uh, they reconcile after fights. So here you have, for example, a picture of two chimpanzees, males, who have been in a fight. The fight ends in a tree, and then 10 minutes later, one of them holds out their hand and begs the other for contact. And then they come together, and they kiss and embrace, and that's the reconciliation. So reconciliation, which relates to the concept of forgiveness in humans, is actually quite common in the practice. We define it as a friendly reunion after a fight. So here you have another one. Uh, a male attacks a female in chimpanzees. The female comes back to him. She offers her hand for a hand kiss. That's where our hand kiss comes from. Uh, I, uh, I think it's an independent invention that we made. Uh, and then they proceed to a mouse and mouse kiss. So that's the reconciliation in chimpanzees. And reconciliations can be found in many species. Uh, I'm not going to go into the data. We, we do observations of how these reconciliations come about and how often they come about. Uh, I'm going to skip that. But we have now evidence for reconciliation in all social animals, basically. So uh, certainly social mammals, but also some birds. And so hyenas, dolphins, elephants, um, dogs. You find reconciliation in almost all species. There's, there's only one species where it has not been found. That's an animal many of you have at home, and that's the domestic cat. I've always had cats at home, and I'm still waiting for a reconciliation. Uh, they're just not good at it. But they are solitary hunters, and they may not need it. So, so it's something that is needed in societies of cooperative animals who need each other. So if you then have a fight with somebody that you work with every day, you need to make up. Uh, and so reconciliation is now known for many, many different species uh, of animals. And, and if you do the same studies on children as we do on the monkeys, uh, you find the same sort of behavior, you find the same sort of graphs. Uh, and this has been done all over the world in all, in all sorts of um, uh, children, usually spontaneous. They look for spontaneous conflicts, which, as you know, children have quite easily. And then uh, we wait for the reconciliation. This is a human reconciliation. This was uh, Obama when he was still a senator. He had a fight with McCain. And it was played out in the Washington Post for a month. And then the photographer acted like a primatologist and took pictures of the actual reconciliation between them. And what I like is the, the facial expression on Obama. You can try to do that for yourself. He, he presses his lips together and puts air under his lips. We call that the, bul the bulging lip space. And the bulging lip space is shown by chimpanzee males when they confront each other. Two males try to intimidate each other and have their hair up and try to look big and strong. The one who withdraws and steps back and probably regrets the confrontation is the one who has that kind of expression. It's expression of submission or regret. And I have an enormous collection of that expression. It's, um, <laughs> It's a, very common, it's a very common expression. So you remember Clinton, he had a lot of regret at this point. So it's an expression that you see when there are scandals or regrets. Or, uh, each time that happens, you see this expression. It's a male expression. Only males show it. So uh, I sometimes ask my, my German audiences, because they have a female leader, uh, if she ever does that, then all they come up with is this picture. This is not enough. This is not really a bulging lip space. And so it's a male expression. It's either because women never regret anything, or they, they don't have the opportunity to be in scandals or something. I don't know. They don't have the expression. Now, about the future. So reconciliation and 
forgiveness relates to the past, there's an emotion related to the past. About the future, uh, there's all sorts of experiments, and the first ones that were done were done by Wolfgang Perler uh, 100 years ago, before the behaviorists got a hold of us. And he would hang a banana very high and give his tits boxes and sticks and see what they would do. So he would not train them, they would have to figure it out by themselves. And he found that they sometimes would stack the boxes and take the stick and reach the banana. And so we argued that animals can do things without training, without trial and error, just on the basis of thinking. So he said animals can think. This is a hundred years ago, and, and he was always um, given as an example of someone who was not very scientific, even though now we have all sorts of evidence for all sorts of species that thinking does really occur. So in order to, to look at that, at the zoo where I used to work in the Netherlands, we hung up some bananas at the chicken enclosure to see if they would do the same thing. And we would give them boxes and sticks and see what they would do. Uh, and here you see a young male who has a, a box and stick. So he has already the right ID. He's not stacking the boxes, but he has the right ID. <laughs> and you will see that he, he puts the box in the right position each time, so in the upright position. <laughs> so now he's going to get it. So the big male is the alpha male. He has a different strategy, which is also a good strategy um, to get the banana. And, and then in the same group, we had a female who developed a technique that I ne Perla had never described and no one has ever described to me before. You will see how that goes. It was, was extremely effective. So that was... Uh, that was very creative. <laughs> and this, this female became famous three months later because she brought down a drone. And it became a famous case because GoPro turned it into a, um, an advertisement. And um, what happened is that the chimps see birds coming by all the time and they don't mind the birds. But the drone, they didn't really like it. They, they hated the drone. So what you will see, and this is a form of planning also, you will see uh, five chimps with sticks waiting for the drone to bring it down. This is the advertisement that they made out of it. See how much here? So now the drone approaches the chimps, and there's five chimps waiting here. Test goes with, with human children. 
and then I'll explain how it goes to spiral. Okay, so that's your. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you another one, so we don't have to. But stay in here and stay in the chair until I come back, okay? All right. All right, The, 
the dog is often used in this literature as an example of an animal without disgust. And so these psychologists, they write about this very happily. They say, well, of course, it's dogs. They lick their testicles and they eat their feces. Clearly, the dog doesn't have disgust. But if you present the dog with a citrus fruit, which is really not something you should do because it's poisonous for them, but if you give them a piece of lemon, they have a disgust response. I'll show you the, the quick version and then I'll slow it down for you. This is a, a little dog. <laughs> and I'll slow it down for you. What the dog does is with the tongue pushes something out of the mouth and then shakes his head. So if there were something in his mouth at this point, it would be gone. And that's the disgust response of a dog. I'll give you the slow down version. So the dog has a clear disgust response. He's just not disgusted by the things we think he should be disgusted by. But they do have a clear response. And you can see the disgust in chimpanzees, for example, in the rain. Chimpanzees hate rain. And this is a female who uh, is walking around with her hands like this because they don't like to get their hands wet. So the hands are protected. And she's pretty miserable at this point. And the, the chimpanzees have a specific rain face that they show when it rains. This is a regular face in a female chimp. This is the face she pulls when it starts raining. It's very similar to the human disgust face. We, we, bring, we bring the upper lip close to the nose and we bring the eyebrows down. And uh, that's the way we express disgust. Uh, and I recently found actually the rain face in the human. This is the human rain face. <laughs> What I find so interesting is that she's covering her hands also, right? What is that with the hands and rain? I don't know. Um, as, as a Dutchman, I should know that the Dutch are very often, it rains a lot, and we're very often on our bikes, and so we see a lot of rain. And if you look in Holland at the 1,000 people who ride by on bikes every day, you see the rain face very clearly. It's very easily observable. So we have experiments on disgust. Let me first explain what you're going to see here. You're going to see here a uh, wild macaque, a Japanese monkey, who is presented by a scientist with three items. One is, um, what is it? One is plastic feces here, one is a piece of plastic, and one is real feces. And she puts food on it. And of course the monkey um, likes to eat the food but it's very hesitant about the real feces. Real feces, because we think disgust has to do with contamination. There's certain things you should not eat. Uh, certainly eating the feces of somebody else is not a healthy thing to do, and so they should be disgusted by that. We'll see how this goes. She has already, she has already eaten the food of these two items, the first two, but she's much reluctant about um, the piece of real feces. And that's where she's going now. And she's, she is hesitant. She wants to eat the food, but she doesn't like the feces one. Now we do experiments on the sense of fairness. 
uh, in primates and, and it started with the capuchin monkeys and that's why I'm going to show you capuchin monkeys first. I did it with Sarah Brosnan. We discovered by accident, I, I, I ran at the Yerkish Primate Center a lab with 25 capuchin monkeys for a long time. And we always tested them in pairs. We never isolated the monkeys. And they lived in a group. We would take two of them out and put them in a test chamber. And uh, because the, the monkeys didn't take well to testing on their own, they always needed to have a test them. And so we always tested them in pairs. And we found that instead of just paying attention to the test that we did and the task and the rewards, they were always watching what the other one was doing. And they were always watching what the other one was getting. And if the other one got better food than they, they got upset. And so we started testing that out by doing a very simple experiment where we bring two monkeys together and we can give them both pieces of cucumber for the task or both grapes. Um, and grapes are 100 times better for these monkeys than cucumber um, because cucumber is just water as me and grapes have sugar in them. So, uh, but, but then sometimes we get that one of them grapes and the other one cucumber and then we create a difference. And so that's how we found that they have a pretty strong response to inequity. I'm not going to go over the data on this, um, but there is data, let's say that. I'll show you the video that has been seen 200 million times now on the internet, which is very popular. I think it's the most popular animal experiment on the internet. And that is because people send it to their boss to complain about the sound. I want to see is how the monkey who gets cucumber responds to the other one getting grape. So the one on the left works for cucumber. The task is very simple. They need to give us a rock, and we take it, and we give them the food. And the first piece of cucumber, uh, she's still eating. She still likes the first pieces, it's fine. The second monkey now gives us a rock and gets a grape. And the first one, the first one looks at us, gives us a rock again, and then gets cucumber again. to equalize outcomes, they like to get the most. And so here's, there's all these mothers who do my monkey experiments on their children uh, in a way that I would never get permission for. And so what this mother has done, and, and she has allowed me to show this, is she gives a whole cookie to uh, her boy and a half cookie to her girl, and you will see how that goes. This one's for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Really? <laughs> so this reaction, f first of all, the, the girl has the same reaction as the monkey. 
And for me, it's always if, if two related species, like monkeys and children, if two related species have the same responses under the same circumstances, you have to call it the same thing. You have to assume the same psychology behind it. And so uh, I don't necessarily make these distinctions uh, that we need to call it something else in animals than we do in humans. Second, what I want to say is that the girl is unreasonable. The girl is half the size of the boy, so half a cookie is perfectly fine. <laughs> and she's unreasonable, and anim in animals we know this also, because the same experiment that we did with the monkeys has now been done with dogs. I recently met a, a lady who said I have a, um, what is it, a chihuahua and a Great Dane, and the chihuahua insists on the same amount of food as the Great Dane. <laughs> So, so animals can be unreasonable in this context, uh, and uh, I think the reactions are very much uh, similar. And, and as I said, in chimpanzees it gets more complex, and in adult humans I think it gets more complex than this. But the first reaction is, I'm not getting what the other one is getting. So we do studies on empathy. Do I still have time? Do we, are we running out of time, or who is, how is this? And we just keep going? So, um, Empathy, this is the dictionary definition of empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And you see immediately the two components of empathy. You see the, the cognitive one, which is the understanding part, and the, the, the emotional one, which is the feeling part. And I think empathy always needs to be divided in these two. And the empathy, the feeling part is very old. The emotional part of empathy is very old, and your dog has empathy also in that regard. The understanding part, to, to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else and understanding their situation, that's much more complex and that may be much more limited in other species. So we do, for example, studies on consolation. This is a bonobo in the front here who has lost a fight and the other one puts arms around it and, and provides consolation. And consolation is also the first way that human empathy was studied. So the first studies on human empathy were done by a psychologist who would go into families and ask adults to start crying and saying that they are in pain and then see how very young children would respond. And very young children, even two years old, they would already walk up to this person and touch them and stroke them. And if they could talk, they would say, how are you doing? A girl's doing it more than boys, and so the sex difference and empathy very early in life is visible. And so that's the consolation behavior of the humans. And in apes, it's very common. In monkeys, it's less common, but in apes, it's very common. I'll show you two examples. Uh, this is a baby bonobo, maybe three or four years old, who gets bitten by a female and then screams, and you will see how that goes. Ben, didn't you just uh, attack Malak? So you see also how the consolation very abruptly stops the screaming, so it's extremely effective. Uh, here you have another case of a screaming bonobo. Masisi. Masisi just got bitten by the Sala. Um, came. So consolation behavior is, is easily observable in the apes uh, and ju just as easy as it is in, in human children. And we do that kind of research in, uh, at Lola, in, which is the only bonobo sanctuary in the world, which is in the Congo, uh, where unfortunately there's a lot of bushmeat hunting. And so we have all these orphan bonobos uh, that need to be taken care of. They're brought to Lola. Uh, and so all of these bonobos here that you see are traumatized orphans. The, their mothers have been shot by poachers. Uh, the baby bonobos have been brought to the market and then adopted into, um, by humans into the sanctuary. And so they're all traumatized orphans. Except for a few, you see a few babies on the backs of females. They are born in, in the colony itself. And so we have a few mother reared ones, but all of them are orphans. And uh, we know from studies on human orphans, uh, Romanian orphanages, we know that traumatized orphans have a lot of trouble with empathy. They have a lot of trouble with emotion regulation, which is necessary for empathy, and so they have a lot of trouble with it. And if we look at the data on these guys, 
we see that the young ones, the young bonobos, they do twice as much consolation behavior as the adults. I don't think the adults have less empathy, but they become more selective. But the most important finding is that we have only juveniles which are mother-reared, which are reared by their own mother, and they do far more. And so that same effect that has been reported for humans is that um, the orphans have trouble with empathy. Uh, and so that's the sort of studies that we do on empathy. And that kind of consolation behavior can be studied, it has been studied in dogs also. If you, if you do a study in the human family where people cry, dogs will also approach this person and try to lick their face and things like that. We do it in elephants, and so consolation is actually a very common response in many mammals. Now the last thing I want to say a few things about is the title of the book and about Mama the Chimpanzee. The title of the book is because Mama was such a central figure and she died at some point, and a, a video was made available of her last moments uh, and became extremely viral, uh, and I'll show you the video, but before I do that, let me say a few things about Mama herself. Mama was the alpha female of a chimpanzee colony, uh, the big one in, in Arnhem where they used to work with, and she was alpha female for 40 years. She died at the age of 59, um, to be alpha female for 40 years is a very long time. The males usually, they are, they are alpha for five years or so, and then they are replaced by somebody else. Um, but the female, female high status is not based on physical strength necessarily. Mama could barely walk by the end of the life. She was still alpha female because she, she had poor eyesight and could barely walk. Because it is not based on physical strength, it's based on personality and age, basically. And, and those are very stable uh, traits. So she was a very central figure in the colony. And even though chimpanzees are dominated by males physically, that doesn't mean that she didn't take a lot of decisions, social decisions in the group. So that in chimpanzees, you always have to make that distinction, in humans also, I would say, that distinction between physical dominance and social dominance. And socially, she was very high-ranking. Physically, she, 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 she had no way of dealing with the adult males. And so Mama was a very central figure. And uh, this is a, a picture of her at her 50th birthday. And you see already that she has aged at this point. And she lived in this very large colony, uh, of which I have described the politics and everything a long time ago. When she was dying, in the last few weeks of her life, uh, my professor, Jan van Hoof, who is over 80 at this point, uh, decided to visit her and, and to say goodbye to her. And he had also known her for 40 years, just as I had known her. And um, we never go in normally with a chimpanzee. A chimpanzee a male is five times human male arm strength. A female has three and a half times human male arm strength. And so you never go in with an adult chimpanzee um, because it's far too risky. Uh, but he decided, since she was so weak and she was dying and he had known her for such a long time, to make an exception and to go in. And you will see the moment that he said his goodbyes. And what you will also see is that Mama at first doesn't know he's there. Then at some point she realizes he is there. And then uh, she embraces him and he embraces her. And you will see how that goes. Yeah, I so yeah, this was a very emotional moment, of course, and, and many people have seen this video and were very affected by it. The reason I took this as the title of the book is because many people were also surprised by it. And I was surprised by their reaction, in the sense that many people were surprised at the facial expression of a chimpanzee and the hand gestures, such as this tapping that she's doing, that they are so human-like. Well, we have been saying for 50 years that chimpanzees are our closest relatives, who share 98.5% of our DNA. So why are people surprised that their emotional expressions are so similar to that of humans? 
the hand gesture actually that she makes is something that female chimpanzees do when they have a baby who has been crying. So to, to calm someone down. And, and that's also, I think, Jan van Hoof, the professor, he was nervous going in there. And, and it's actually mama who reassures him rather than the other way around. She, she was that kind of uh, individual. She was, she was always the, the sort of the mother of the group. That's why she's called mama. And so you see the reaction. And the reason I took this as the title of the book is because the emotional responses of the great apes are indeed extremely similar to those of ourselves. And uh, people have not always recognized that. And so in conclusion, I think animals can be studied. Uh, the emotions of animals can be studied. You don't need to know necessarily what they feel. It would be wonderful if one day we know what they feel, and maybe that will happen. But um, the emotions are expressed in the body and are therefore perfectly measurable. I look at the emotions as organs. They're, they're all functional, and we all share them uh, in the sense that I don't have any organ in my body that you don't find in a dog. We, we all, and, and you don't find in a frog even. We all have kidneys and livers and hearts and lungs and brains, and all these organs we have in the body are present in other bodies, and I think the same is true for the emotions. We, we don't have particularly human emotions. And I think emotions are always controlled and regulated in all species, not just in the human species. And I thank all the students who work with me and work on these projects that you have just seen. And I thank you for your attention. Your questions? Yeah, we have a microphone maybe for someone who has questions. Don't be shy. There's one over there. Was that the first time they had ever touched? What? So the last hug, was that the last, the first time they had ever touched? Oh, no, 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 no. We, 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 we have a lot of contact with, with her and with other chimps through the bars. So uh, a grooming session through the bars, we do that kind of thing, yeah. We don't necessarily kiss them, and, but because uh, that, that gets a bit uh, tricky. But uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of contact. more emotional than males? Is there a difference between male and female emotions in the I, I think the, the, the sexes have different emotions. I, I would never say that females are more emotional than males. Males get emotional about different things. In the human species also, if you, if you look at men during sports games, I think there's plenty of emotions there. So, uh, for example, the Dutch football supporters. So, uh, yeah, I think there are different rules. In humans, also different rules for the expression of emotions. So certain, certain emotions are more easily expressed by, by males and females and the other way around. Uh, and I think in the, in the chimpanzees, you also see different emotions in the two. But I, I would never say that the one is more emotional than the other one. Microphone, microphone. Hi. Are there any uh, gay monkeys? Or that you would know that? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't say much about bonobos, but um, bonobos have sex in all combinations of uh, individuals. Uh, and I, w I would not necessarily call them gay um, in the sense that they are not exclusively oriented to their own sex. Um, but homosexual contact, let's say, sexual interactions between members of the same sex is very common in many species. So in bonobos, it's more common than, uh, bonobos and dolphins are known for that. Uh, it's more common, but other species, that happens also. So it's really not um, exclusively human. It's only, when, it's, it's, it's only exclusive homosexuality 
where you have an exclusive orientation that is maybe uh, not found in other species. I, I don't know cases of that. We have time for one more. One more, yes, sure. Hi, I was just going to ask um, what you thought about Skinner if he was still alive today. That was quite a long time ago, and I know a lot of behavioral psychologists today that uh, you know, came from the Skinner background, but really today embrace everything that you're saying and have evolved along with all the rest of the, you know, the rest of the world. So I wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, I think Skinner uh, was very unfortunate that for a whole century, uh, behavioral science was dominated by Skinner, who didn't believe very much in evolution. He didn't believe very much in neuroscience. He thought animals were li little machines that you could train to do certain things, but anything that they did spontaneously, he was not particularly interested in. And, and, and I'm the opposite. I'm much more interested in their spontaneous behavior than what they do when you put them on a bicycle and have them ride around or something like that. But yeah, the, the, the Skinnerians, I think, it's a very unfortunate period. I don't see much redeeming value in the way they think. But I'm, of course, a biologist. The biologists always think different from the psychologists. We always think more in evolutionary terms. And, and it is very nice to see that there's now a whole new generation of scientists, young scientists, for the last 25 years, who are breaking with that old tradition and are talking more about cognition and more about emotions, are much more open-minded about it. It doesn't mean that we have a, a big, powerful theory at this moment. I think there's a bit lacking in, in that regard. But at least that old paradigm, uh, which doesn't fit anymore, we have abandoned now. We stop now. We stop now. Thank you.